Welcome everyone to Watch Challenge. On each episode, we challenge ourselves to find and watch a film of a particular type and then report back the results to each other and you find listeners. My name is Mike Went. And I'm Aaron Spears. This episode's challenge is, it is the season, Mike. It is Oscar time. Yes. One of my favorite times of the year. <laughs> what what better way to take a look at Oscars than like all those ones that have been snubbed. Yeah, never been uh, didn't get either their just desserts as far as any nominations or maybe the film did get some nominations. But what the hell? Not the right ones or just didn't win, even though they were nominated, which I will say we generally are. Our approach is usually more like let's celebrate, you know, the discoveries that are out there in world cinema yeah. throughout the years. So we do skew, I think, positive uh, for the most part here. Let's, you know, <laughs> there's so much good stuff to talk about. Um, this one may get a little angry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, obviously, you know, with the the, the breakdown of the, the Academy, uh, oftentimes, as from what I've read, you know, and I think it's it's been that way ever since it, it was instituted, mm-hmm. is about 60 percent male. And they're usually that the median age is about 70 or so. So you say median age. That's what I, Whoa. a good majority of, okay. of the members are old. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not, not to say an old bias, uh, you know, much respect for so many of those crafts, crafts persons that, yeah, that, yeah, are, that still, are out there. Like, but there's young blood in Hollywood, <laughs> right? <laughs> Their taste sometimes they have a certain taste, or they have, I don't, or maybe they're influenced by advertising campaigns or something. But mm-hmm. for whatever reason, yes, there are certain things that get completely overlooked, and and who knows, maybe some of these things that we think are horribly overlooked are, you know, maybe they miss it by just like five votes or something like that, and it, you know. There's one podcast that I listen to that hopes that once a hundred years of the Academy has been instituted, okay, that they will, uh, because it's been a hundred years and nobody's probably alive, that they will review, we re- uh, release the vote tallies. You oh. know, so like maybe you can find out if did did Wings win the first Best Picture by overwhelming margin or was it by a handful of votes? Yeah, or was it a squeaker? Who knows if they'll ever do that. It would be sweet, though, I think. Interesting. (laughs) Yeah. I actually have a little bit of information, which we'll go over with my main pick, that sometimes there is information that comes out. And I should also say, too, I'm deferring to you for for Oscar history and and whatnot, (laughs) because for some reason, as a movie guy, and I don't know if it was just like my shitty punk rock attitude when I was a teenager, but when I got into movies, everybody in my family just assumed like, oh, you're a big Oscar guy. So they would like call me up at the time or send me emails like, Oh, who, you know, what's my, I got an Oscar poll. What should I pick? I'm like, I'm not that guy. I, <laughs> except for a brief bit in the nineties when like a lot of the indie boom was happening and a lot of the, the, well, previous episode, a lot of Sundance of darlings were getting Academy love. I was like, hell yeah. Yeah. Um, I was into it then, but honestly, I think working at the theater too. I, I always closed on Sunday. So I, I didn't watch the Oscars for mm. a couple of decades. I would just see the clips on YouTube if something funny happened, somebody got smacked, somebody read out the wrong movie title, uh, you know, I'd go and watch the clips. So that's, uh, we got, we got two different interesting points of view, I think, going into this one. Oh yeah. I, I'm big, like Oscar parties, lo- you know, have, have gone to one probably since, uh, since college at least. But, uh, mm-hmm. and a lot of times I will, I'll do the, the pools and many times I have one. Uh, sometimes I will purposely, pick something wrong so I don't win so I don't seem like a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> but is it a true contest then if you're throwing it? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's sometimes like maybe I'm like, oh, I would really love if this person wins. So I'll, I'll just put that one even though oh, gotcha. okay. conventional wisdom or at least from all the pundits, which right, there are right. way too many now. <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. There's like more pundits for the Oscars than there are for like presidential elections, which is kind of funny <laughs> to me. Um, it's such an easy thing to have an opinion on too, I think. So yes. Yes. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. I should say up, up to through college, I was not above like an Oscar party, but it was not, 
not something I was very ever good at, I guess, is picking the winners. And a sure. lot of times I was just like, I, I didn't see most of these, which actually this year I'm doing pretty solid and I'm not, I wasn't that great at keeping up during 2022, but, um, so far I'm, I think I'm on track to get a lot of the stuff checked off in the next week or so. Now for, for the years that you worked at Cedar Lee mm-hmm. was, I mean, cause they always got almost every Oscar nominee like that, yes, that didn't really give you like the, that didn't really like get your peak, your interest or, or, or like even further, or is it just kind of just like, Hey, it's another, you know, a dime a dozen kind of thing. No, no, no. I didn't have, um, so I'm, I've obviously I'm a, a fan of the art of cinema. So like sure. you know, anything that gets people talking about the movies, all that, I think you may have touched on something here that I hadn't really thought too much about. And that is being an art house theater. Yeah. We would get as best we could. Oh God, bookings always sucked because the nominations come out that Tuesday and we couldn't get to our bookings on Monday. Cause we didn't know <laughs> who was going right. to, you know, win what movies we needed to get in, but it would always boost attendance in a great way. And there was a lot of people hanging out. They want to talk about the movies afterwards. Hey, that, I'm your guy. Like, let's talk about these movies here. And also I could just watch them for free. Cause I already at work right. there. So I was up to speed on them through the years, but maybe just week, not even week, just day after day of like my job <laughs> being around all of this Oscar talk for all of the weeks from nomination to awards. I think it may have just killed it a little bit for me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I totally understand. Cause yeah. it's, Cause then everybody has their opinions and everybody, Oh, this is definitely going to win or yeah. Right. No, I, I could see where that could get annoying. <laughs> and it would also steer me in the wrong direction for Oscar pools because I was in the very small sample size of, you know, art house film goers in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Um, well like, you know, of course movie X was going to win and you're like, that didn't win. I'm like, that's what everybody's been talking about. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just, uh, depends on, on who you're talking with there, but. Well, let's start off with this year. Uh, This year, the nominations are out for the, what are we at, 90? The 95th. 95th. Okay, so in five more years, we'll test your theory. Um, (laughs) I'm on board of that. I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Um, But uh, yeah, 95th nominations are out. Any any surprises for you, Mike? Any snubs from this year that we needed uh, to mention? Yeah, I mean, I was mostly happy with, with the 10 features that got nominated for Best Picture, but I was, I am, uh, there is like, right now on Twitter is a group of us that call ourselves the Babylon hive. And um, so when Babylon was not named one of the 10 best pictures, uh, Mm -hmm. I, I was frankly pissed off. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And actually there was somebody uh, sharing the clip on Twitter of the, uh, you, have you seen Babylon? I have not, but oh, I am also okay. upset. Okay. So. <laughs> well, this is not to spoil it for anybody, but there is this one particular scene where, uh, and I might even talk about another episode, but Margot Robbie's character, uh, you know, it, it's transitioned from silent films to talkies. Mm-hmm. And she is starring in her first talkie and she's supposed to hit this X mark where the microphone is because at the time they didn't have movable boom mics just yet. And she keeps missing her mark. And the AD is like trying to be patient. But then (laughs) crew members start sneezing. Uh, They actually, and the cameraman who's in this like, this uh, soundproof box. Like the refrigerator thing? Yeah. Yeah, soundproof box. And it's hot. And he's like, oh, I'm I'm having heart palpitations. (laughs) So the AD starts saying like, you know, like, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. So this clip got like spread around Twitter when it was not named one of the, <laughs> the best. Yeah, yeah, I did see that clip going on, but I, d- I didn't know context because. Uh, oh, God. Yeah, it's so funny. I mean, it's like basic, like if you've seen Singing on the Rain, which is like, you know, a very good film. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like an R rated version of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on board. Holidays got crazy. And then I there was two weeks uh, I was trying to get out to see it. And it was only playing at like 945 p.m. Yeah. I was like, well, fuck, like I have to get like I gotta get my kids on the bus in the morning. I can't do three hours at that point. So I was hoping Tuesday when those nominations come out, they're going to add some screenings and it won't only be at like yeah. you know, 945, whatever. At I'm kind of hoping then, it becomes one of those movies that plays like once a month, like uh Rocky horror or something. That would be great. Like, yeah. It, but that might be too much uh, yeah. pie in it's the sky. It's a weird world. You never know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was a little surprised. So one of the categories I always like looking at for the Oscars is best original screenplay. Mm -hmm. I feel like over the years, and especially since Jordan Peele's film career, feature film career has taken off. Yeah. I think there's been renewed interest in like, hey, the newer stuff, maybe maybe um, up and coming auteurs or people that are really pushing the boundaries with what we can do in the storytelling are rewarded in an original screenplay or, you know, adapted as well. But yeah. usually that original one, I think, is, is always really interesting to look at. And I went to that one this year because I was really hoping for, I mean, honestly, I kind of thought Nope would be in there. Like they've been celebrating George oh, Beale's absolutely. like writing, if not his directing. So I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not in there. I was really surprised. Uh, what's her name? The star, uh, Kiki Palmer wasn't in there. Like that was, uh, yeah. I don't know, like great roles throughout there, but like she just like pulled that movie together for me. Like if she wasn't there, like I, the energy level for me at least would have been way down. Oh on, yeah. On Nope. Her um, charm. Oh, just that effortless movie. in that. Yes. Yeah. It's, I mean, not actually effortless, but it just, it came across as so just like, boom, man. Yeah. What a spark here. You just made um, me smile the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Even, even though like the scenes, like if she's like in terror, it's just like, she still made me smile just because like yeah. she just really, I don't know. She, she came through in a big uh, way. Yeah. But I mean, we know, you know, horror movies tend to not get too much love necessarily at the Oscars. Yeah. Although I think, you know, again, with Jordan Peele's current uh, feature film career, I think maybe hopefully that's starting to skew a little differently with the Oscars, but I was really surprised that, um, barbarian, I kind of mm. thought that might squeak in as like an original screenplay. Um, cause I really yeah. saw a lot of critics focusing on the, um, the, the craftsmanship of that, that story and that screenplay and the structure to it is really unique, uh, and interesting, you know, long shot getting Justin long in there as supporting actor or something, but, yeah. um, you know, I was floored by him cause like, I've never liked him as an actor and I was just like, ah, oh, fuck he's in it. And then the, what he does with that character is like, I'm whoa. You have yeah. range. I was surprised, but at least like the story there, I thought like, okay, well that, that may get something. Yeah. There, there's actually, there's one film that it played at Sundance and it also played at a uh, Cleveland international film festival this year. Um, I thought maybe could have been a, um, it, it, it was always probably a, once again, a, a dark horse pie in the sky. Sure. Uh, but it was called cha-cha real smooth. I thought, Oh yeah. It, it deserved uh, maybe a screenplay consideration and then also uh, Dakota Johnson, I thought could have been a great supporting actress picture mm -hmm. uh, pick for that that film. Uh, she had she has to show like a pretty good range that we haven't really seen from her before. She was also a producer on the movie, so oh, okay. you felt like she really had a passion for the project. I think sure. um, some I think there's some people who find the the lead actor who is also the writer director a little bit annoying. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, when I was watching it at uh, Sif, you know, there, there were quite a few people who were like, Oh, I can't stand this kid. But <laughs> I, I thought he was like very charming, but yeah, but she is, I think the the standout as far as acting in that movie. Correct me if I'm wrong here too. The other one that kind of surprised me because there's so much talk ahead of time was RRR. Oh and yeah. That song nomination. Yeah. Is it got it? nominated for, yeah. Uh, okay. Not to, not to. And India, decided not to submit it as their international um, selection. Oh, they, interesting. They, they submitted a movie that also played at Cleveland International called, oh, it's called like the, it, it's almost like, I forget the name of the movie. It's like film, film is in the title and it's very much like India's version of Cinema Paradiso. And uh, I, I watched it and it was great. I, I thought it was really good, but from what I've heard, there is a split in the in India's cinema. You have a north and a south, yes. essentially. So the Bollywood films oversee, supersede sometimes the Tollywood films, which is what RRR is. Right. But then you can argue the movie that they ultimately submitted, which is I'm just going to call it's the last film show. The last film show, yeah. Yeah. The last film show is like neither you know, a Bollywood or Tollywood. It's just, it happens to be like a straightforward narrative without song and dance and everything. But, uh, but RRR, I think maybe if it was nominated in that category, it stands a would stand a, a huge chance to win, but it seems like all quiet on the Western front. It was there is the international film of the year. Well, it has, um, I think they have is, Triangle of Sadness is best picture as well. Oh, correct. Correct. So, okay. That, yeah. That that's his uh 
his English language de- debut. Okay, yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so a true foreign language spoken in the movie. We've got all quiet on the Western Front. Yeah, in the Best Picture and Best, what is it? International feature as well. Yeah. American. Okay, interesting. Speaking, oh, I have one last. Sorry, I have one last snub for this year. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> Decision to leave. Park Chan Wook's film was overlooked in every every category. Oh yeah, that was a magnificent film. Yeah. It's so is it more or less infuriating to you if it's entirely forgotten like decision to leave was or like Babylon, which I think got like maybe some production design or yeah, like a couple of tech awards, uh, best original score looks like best production design. You're like, okay, so you saw it. What the hell? Right. Like that feels yeah. like that may be almost more infuriating to me. No, you're right. Uh, gosh. Yeah. It's, it's somewhat in the middle. Cause it's like, yeah, I mean Babylon showed up probably where where I would have put it, but but yeah, I I don't know what you know. Even Margot Robbie gives her freaking she like goes way above and beyond for that movie, but I don't know. Maybe it was just I think we talked about it last episode. You know the recency bias, like you know that movie was one of the last to get released, so maybe not enough people oh, yeah. saw it. That that could be one of the cases. So I don't know. Sometimes I, I just don't know what, what the people are thinking or you know, <laughs> maybe did she, has she sit, shit in a lot of people's cereal? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Or maybe it's, uh, well, I don't know. Like we'll, we'll speculate on Babylon once I've seen it and can talk yeah. about it. So, but uh, <laughs> no, that it's interesting. I, I think it was on like the cracked podcast years ago or, or somewhere I was, I, th- I remember hearing about it. It had to have been on some film podcast at some time where they were hypothesizing, why don't we do film awards like five years after the year? Oh, yeah. And so that would get rid of this recency bias where either like, and it could work either for or against a movie. Um, I like picking on Shakespeare and Love because I don't think that should have ever won Best Picture. I don't think it should have even been nominated. Oh, Fine yeah. if you like it, whatever. But, sure. you know, there's quality cinema from that year that should have been celebrated. And yet somehow because of campaigning and who knows what behind the scenes shenanigans, it was, what's his name after all, who knows, right. you know, you get in there and you, and you get, you get an award for a film like that. Whereas if you waited five years, I don't think Shakespeare and love would have even been in the conversation about that film year. So yeah. in some, some movies I think get sometimes hurt because of how the studio put, you know, they waited to the very, very last minute, like women talking, it still got nominated for best picture, mm-hmm. but uh, United Artists, uh, MGM decided to like not put it out in markets like us, Cleveland, sure, you know, until last week, you know. So it's like, yeah. you know, I know like then there's probably been plenty of screenings for LA, New York people, mm-hmm. but I'm not, I wasn't surprised when it only got two nominations instead of maybe potentially a lot more, had more people had the opportunity to see it. Well, that's true too, because you want to create, because uh, the voting members of the Academy aren't like in some isolated bubble where they don't get the internet or anything. Like if there's buzz and there's chatter around it or people are celebrating right. or talking about it, I feel like that's going to add to how everybody sees movies. Like there's hype around them. Your friends are talking about it. You're seeing stuff yeah. online. You can't wait because of the people involved in the movie or whatever. Uh, so it almost like robs the movie of having some momentum or some hype to it. Right. Um, from the public's perspective as well, too. So, huh. Interesting. Well, that's uh, probably enough complaining for now about 2022. Let's uh, <laughs> yeah. take a look back in history at uh, Oscar snubs. Any, um, actually, if I, I let me, if I can start with an honorable mention, Mike, it ties directly Absolutely. into what you were just saying. So speaking of the transition to talkies and you mentioned singing in the rain, that to me is going to be one of those movies that I always think of, of like, it's, I love a musical. I love like that golden era of, of Hollywood musicals. I think it just because I'm a film geek and it deals with the transition from silent to sound films. It's one of my, I mean, I'd probably put it like top 10, just American films I've ever seen. Yeah. And it's iconic in the public consciousness as being like one of the musicals you've got Stanley Donan, Gene Kelly, also co-directing. Uh, you got the Freed Unit going strong. It's in glorious Technicolor. The songs are amazing. They get stuck in your head. Uh, I mean, Singing in the Rain is like, if you're going to do a montage of Hollywood musicals, you've got to have Gene Kelly singing, singing in the rain. Yes. In the rain, oh, yeah. puddles. You got to be there. And when you go back and look at the history of it, it got nominated for 
Jean Hagen, which is fine. She's great as uh, Lena Lamont. Speaking of not being able to transition to talkies very well. Yeah. And then Lenny Hayden for best scoring of a musical picture. There's no best yeah. song. There's no Gene Kelly. There's no Stanley Donan. There's no production design. There's none of the stuff that makes that movie no iconic picture. and has lasted. <laughs> yeah. There's no Donald O'Connor. There's no make them laugh. I mean, oh my God. I, it, it's still infuriating because even I, like, I knew it had had some nominations. I'm like, let me look that up before I bring it up on the episode. And I was like, wait, two? I was really ahead of my head that it was like five or so. Yeah. Like, Gene Kelly has to be in there. Song has to be in there. And it just didn't win. And I was like, it not only just didn't win the two it was nominated for, it's baffling the two it was nominated for. Yeah. The uh, Seeing Babylon made me watch Singing in the Rain. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it might make you want to wa- rewatch it too. Uh, well, I'm ready. Whatever you see Babylon. <laughs> but yeah, so like, I looked up the, the Best Picture nominees that year. I was like, oh, for sure. Like that must have had like, 10 or 11 competitions. Yeah. And looking at the, yeah, the other movies that were nominated that year, um, you know, high noon. Okay. Oh, that's legit. Definite classic. But most of the other films, very forgettable. I thought the greatest show on earth, Ivanhoe, different Moulin Rouge and the quiet man. Not that they're bad. Not that they're bad. Just, you know, and apparently, you know, greatest show on earth, inspired Spielberg, uh, or, you know, or for, to, to become a filmmaker, but, right. but yeah, but though Ivanhoe, yeah. I mean, I think I remember watching it in a, like an English class or something, but, but yeah, it's like, uh, I don't know, like you couldn't make room for that. Uh, you know, well also too, because this is a, that's a time period. Sorry, we can move on for this. I don't need <laughs> <I'm> just <laughs> to play about sick of the rain, but it was also a time when things were split in the Academy where you don't, you not only have best cinematography, but it's best cinematography, black and white, best cinematography, color, color best art yeah. direction, color, best art direction, black and white. This is a poppin' technicolor musical. Yeah. What? It's crazy. So, all right. My singing the rain rant done. Mike, what's, uh, yeah. what's, what's one of your honorable mentions? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, my first honorable mention is, uh, you know, we, we had talked a little bit earlier in the episode about the, the bias towards horror, um, and while this movie did get four nominations, okay. I think the most egregious snub is uh, from the movie Psycho, uh, Anthony Perkins in Best Direct or Best Actor or Best Supporting Actor, one of the two, you know, whichever. I I don't know, maybe yeah, Best Act, Best Actor, Best Actor, say. yeah. How the hell can, like, can you watch that movie? And, and I mean, Janet Lee got nominated, mm-hmm. rightfully so. And um, Alfred Hitchcock got nominated for best director, but how could you not nominate Anthony Perkins who really gives it his all in this creepy, creepy performance that mind boggling, a little shocking. Uh, (laughs) I mean, there was, there was a lot of, I mean that, that particular year, I think that that was uh, Jack Lemmon one for the apartment, uh, which is, you know, wonderful movie. Um, oh, actually, uh, uh, or was no, I, it was Burt Lancaster for Elmer Gentry. Gentry. Oh, okay. But Jack Lemmon was nominated. Jack Lemmon was nominated. Okay, yeah. yeah. Shoot. Okay. So, anyway. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I mean, he's he's a legend as well. Uh, Burt Lancaster, of course. But, uh, but yeah, the fact that um, Anthony Perkins... Uh, but, but anyway, I mean, obviously, I, I would think most people who are listening to this podcast have seen Psycho. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I, I would highly recommend it if you haven't. Just, uh, you know, the, the way how it was shot in this in the black and white and uh, the way how it kind of unveils. And, you know, now it's like everybody kind of knows the twist at the end. But I'm sure at the time when it came out, it was shocking. And the oh, shower yeah. scene, of course, there's been, you know, there's a documentary just about the shower scene itself. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but yeah, but that's just one I, you know. They should have, they should have shame on them. <laughs> so much shame on them, Mike, that we actually have our first overlap in oh, the history of our show. Nice. <laughs> I felt it so strong when I was looking that up. I was going, wait a, wait a minute. Are you kidding me? Because I knew I'm like, okay, can't, I don't want to do the Hitchcock. That's an obvious Google search. Oscar snubs. You're going to see Hitchcock never won. Yes. And I was like, all right, well, Hitchcock, what do I think of like the birds? No, that's a concept. Like, I was thinking of his other, other ones. I was like, oh, like the most iconic acting role in my opinion coming out of any hitchcock movie is anthony perkins as norman bates in psycho so much so that when i see him and he i think he's on the record talking about it getting other parts later in his career was like he can't live down norman bates yeah 
can he play like a romantic lead? Yes, he's capable of that. But if you've seen Psycho, it's hard to ask the audience to look past that role. It's yeah. so iconic and so disturbing that, yeah, it it, it wasn't even uh, nominated. That said, like, you know, up against Jack Lemmon, you're up against Lawrence Olivier, Spencer Tracy, Burt Lancaster. It's a stacked year. I get it. Yes. But yes. fucking Psycho. And oh, my gosh, was he terrifying in that? Yeah. So amazing. <laughs> yeah. And also, because I was just looking up some of the Psycho stuff before this episode, I was looking at I'm like, OK, so I was assuming there was a Best Picture nomination because Hitchcock was nominated, but it wasn't. It was one of those years where it was split, where you didn't have Psycho as Best Motion Picture, but you had Hitchcock as Best Director. So it was strong enough. The Academy was like, we're going to give him the Best Directing nod. Yeah. But the picture's not going to get nominated. And you're like, well, OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so but it I seemed mean, like it should have gone to him as director, but it didn't get it that year or any year. Yeah. I mean, and like, but I think ultimately, you know, time has been, has been great to that movie where yeah, yeah. Know, it's played at repertory theaters, you know, probably every year mm -hmm. since it's been out. So, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it doesn't necessarily need that Oscar win in the history books, but right. you know, it, 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 it's in the people's hearts where it counts. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, or in my terrified, terrified brain of <laughs> like, even as a kid watching that movie on VHS, like I knew like, oh, it's the shower scene and there's the twist, at, you know, and all that stuff. Like I knew all that. And I was like, still works. Yeah. Still works. It's just visceral <laughs> thrills in a genre. So what's your other honorable mention, Mike? Uh, so my other honorable mention is uh, from uh, uh, 2017, but I think it, it officially came out in the United States in 2018 is uh, Paul Schrader's first performed and for um, the for Ethan Hawke's performance uh, in in that film. Now, Paul Schrader, I I could almost do a whole episode on snubs of Paul Schrader. Uh, you know, True. he finally got his first nomination for that movie for screenplay, where but he's written the you know the screenplays for Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, and Last Temptation of Christ. You know, you name it. You know, he's done some great work. So he was always kind of snubbed but um i thought ethan hawk in this particular film ethan hawk i think is is a fantastic actor sometimes doesn't get i think enough credit that that he deserves but uh this that particular film blew me away when i watched it yeah uh, i was just there were so many things that that were happening in it but he it, like he he's very grounded but then like the, towards the end of the film where he kind of goes off the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he kind of has his Travis Bickle moment, I guess. I, I was just, I was stunned by his performance. And I, w I think he got like nominated almost every other place, maybe like Independent Spirit and other, you know, critic awards, but just did not get the, the Oscar nomination. And maybe, maybe because the movie was too small, maybe it's, Maybe some people found it too weird or too disturbing, but, but man, he, he really knocked it out of the park in that movie. I, thought. I completely agree. Uh, I'm married to an Ethan Hawke hater. So I, I, I end up <laughs> him very, very strongly like, Oh, he's such a greasy creep. Like whatever. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he, he can do it all. But honestly, if you would have just said like, Hey, first reformed, how many nominations did he get? I would have said, screenplay actor like I, I it's not in my head the way it's in your hair I was like oh yeah that has a bunch and then you're like it doesn't have any I'm like I'm double checking that yeah what the hell yeah I just I had it in my head is like that was in a, in a an award at least nominated movie uh especially that role too I would have been like oh yeah he was nominated yeah huh what I'm trying to figure out is wait has Ethan Hawk he's never did he win training day was that it he has never won never won uh, an academy I award I think he was nominated I think you're right. I think he was nominated for Training Day. I think he was also nominated for Best Supporting Actor, excuse me, in Boyhood. Oh, Boyhood, yes. And oh, yeah. Okay, now I'm jogging my memory because also being a Richard Linklater fan, uh, screenplay for oh, the yeah, second for... and third before movies. Correct. I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I mean, not, so, like, he hasn't obviously, he's had his brushes with with Oscars, but um, but no, this was the one I think that. Yeah, it, it, like looking who won that year, I, he could have. I think he could. That would have been my pick, personally. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Also, just like the pow, the punch of that that narrative, but also that his arc in that movie, like his performance and where it goes, is um just devastating. God, picture the role when he actually ends up winning an Oscar. Oh yeah, <laughs> like how intense is that one going to have to be? Yeah. Can't be horror though. Can't be any of his horror right. stuff. Right. And he right. does some interesting horror, but 
uh, yeah. Any other for you? Um, I just had psycho. Uh, <laughs> that was my other one, but I'll do a quick shout out. Um, just, uh, cause it's obviously equally iconic and I can't believe it didn't win and he just passed away. So I'm pretty, pretty bummed, but, uh, Ray Liotta and Goodfellas. Ah, uh, yeah. Another mm. one of those Scorsese tied into a Paul Schrader, obviously like 1980 should have been in there with raging bull, whatever yeah. should have been in there and Goodfellas, you know, whatever. Um, you know, look up the movies that Scorsese has lost to over the years with his projects and you'll just, um, you'll get pissed. <laughs> yeah. And that one, like Ray Liotta will never like live down like the eighties coked out Goodfellas persona yeah. in any movies. He's an operation Dumbo drop. And I'm like, what? he's got to be on cocaine in the background. Right. Like it's just, <laughs> it's just such a, that was, it's like that, that when you first discover a new band and you're like, Oh my God, this band is amazing. That album's probably going to be your favorite. <laughs> no matter what they do the rest of their career, you're probably, it's that one that got you into that band. And I yeah. feel like that's probably the way, um, Ray Liotta and Goodfellas is in my brain. So can't believe that wasn't an award, uh, an Academy award winning performance, but right. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so Mike, what did you, uh, what did you end up picking for uh, your, your watch challenge Oscar snub selection? Yeah. So this one was uh, a movie that I had, I was for sure that I had watched, but then realized as I was watching it, I had not uh, <laughs> like all the way through. Okay. Maybe partially because of its length, but um, I uh, decided to go with uh, 1994's uh, Hoop Dreams by Steve James. It begins with a game, with a basket and a ball. It becomes a journey of heartbreak and hope. From city streets to the brink of fame. Isaiah Thomas! The amazing story of two boys and two families struggling against the odds. My mother, God bless her, she's always said to me, this America, you can make something of your life. Against the system. You have to realize you can make their team win. To make a dream come true. All I ever dreamed about was playing in the NBA. And, um, which is a documentary. And uh, it was... Uh, it was nominated, I believe, for editing, but it was not nominated for best documentary feature. And, uh, you know, not to say that this movie, it didn't have its, it definitely had two huge advocates mm -hmm. in Cisco and Ebert, uh, who both named it their top movie of 94. Uh, recently, I, I rewatched a lot of old Cisco and Ebert episodes, and this was one, it's like they, I think they had like two or three episodes dedicated just to this movie. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, for anybody who has not seen it, um, it is about two young men, William Gates, Arthur, uh, Arthur, uh, Agui, um, who, um, are, you know, have great talent mm -hmm. and, you know, you're, you're followed through their, their high school years as they, um, as you know, both of them go kind of like different directions, you know, yeah. but they're very talented at, basketball but then there you know th there are certain aspects where you know especially one one person i, I don't want to spoil it for no but it, you know it is kind of older but um but yeah boy it, it it really is a is a powerful documentary and cannot it, it's like i cannot believe that movie may i, I don't know maybe it's because it was about someone in Chicago and it's not, doesn't attract to LA or New York, but my God, how could you not pick that movie? <laughs> As, I mean, even it, I mean, it should have been nominated. It should have won, but yeah. um, it is such a, such a great documentary. And I'm, I'm glad that I finally like just sat down, watched the whole thing. Uh, you can find it on HBO max right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Steve James is, a wonderful documentarian. He's with Cartman Films, and mm -hmm. uh, got to got to meet him very briefly at at uh, Cleveland International a few years ago um, with a movie called The Interrupters, which is another wonderful oh yeah documentary. But uh, that one was like, ooh, that one, who really tough. But um, yeah, it, it was just like getting to like shake his hand for a second. It was just like you know, bowing down to him, but I, <laughs> but now I'm like embarrassed that I realized like I didn't watch like his most famous film. Until <laughs> <laughs> He's also really tall. Like, he's a really tall yes. dude. Yes. Um, yeah. I got like, you know, 
shook hands in the hallway because he was also at the festival for Stevie. Um, yes. Like Minter he did as well. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, life itself, 2014, like the, yes. Roger, the Roger Ebert story. Um, spectacular, spectacular documentarian. An overlook that's so egregious, Mike. It was also my pick. Ah, finally. <laughs> Finally did it. <laughs> Marshall got here because of one reason. Arthur A. G. Look at this man. He just explodes, Dan. I may have seen the next Isaiah Thomas. William Gates. Shouldn't Put it in your memory bank. Put it in your memory bank. bank. William okay. Gates. Again, this speaks to like my I guess my shitty memory that if you would have been like Hoop Dreams, you know, 1994, I'm like, oh yeah, it was best documentary winner. 100%. I would have sworn it was the best yeah. documentary winner that year. So, I mean, I'm poking around, looking up and I saw somebody's list of like, oh yeah, Oscar stuff. I'm like, snub for what? Like, they, they want best picture? <laughs> and I, was like, I was like, you gotta be shitting me. And then yeah. I went back and um, I was reading what Roger Ebert was writing at the time uh, when it came out. So obviously like Steve James, Chicago guy, Roger Ebert, Chicago yes. guy. I don't remember who it was, but somebody got Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel to sit down and watch the movie before it went to Sundance. Yeah. And so it was like, I, it's not like it's illegal to do that, but like they wanted sure. to build a good campaign and they got, you know, two like the most famous critics of the time, possibly still to, to see it. And we're just like floored by it. And like you said, they did at least one episode. And then I think they were also just really, really wanting to, to campaign for it. Yeah. During Oscar season, like people, you've got to go see this movie. Uh, one of the reviews I read for Ebert, I think it was actually an anniversary review, like it's 10 year anniversary or 20 year anniversary, uh, mentioning still like it's the way people say like, oh, the great American novel, you know, is catching the wrong, you know, whatever, um, infinite jest, whatever. Roger Ebert is like, this is the great American documentary. Like, it's just yeah. so much about what it means to like be in the culture and the society and the the, the zeitgeist of America at that point in time shot for what was it like four four years at least because it's their yes. whole high school career yeah. um was supposed to i love the fact that it was supposed to be a 30 minute short <laughs> you're like really <laughs> um but you know that steve james talks about that too where like when you're doing documentary subjects like when do you know when you're done shooting and he's talked about that because i think it's the commentary track for hoop dreams he mentions like well you know it's supposed to be a short but then we're like well you know the natural thing would be to follow them through high school because they're yeah. at this elite um they were recruited to this elite uh high school i think their coach was like some famous NBA players coach, like when he was in school. So like, this is where you go if you want to be a star, like basketball yeah. player. It's like the, it's, it's the tops there. And then they, so they, they scraped together money. And I, if I remember correctly, they shot it on video too, which was kind of unheard of for the nineties. Right. Uh, yeah. It definitely, it was a little jarring at first when I, when I started watching it, cause I was like, Oh yeah, this is definitely like early nineties video. Like it felt like, uh, yeah. Like I used to watch a lot of Degrassi when I, <laughs> oh right, right. Which I, I think it was shot on film, but it looked it had just kind of like this more PBS look, I guess. Yes, yeah, exactly. Maybe maybe it wasn't cinematic enough for for the the document or documentary branch of the academy or something. Well, yeah. so I I looked into that a little bit, and I guess Ebert and a whole bunch of filmmakers, specifically Barbara Koppel, were like livid with the academy. Like, what the fuck? And they put so much pressure on the academy. They uh, actually did an investigation and made public their results and i guess again keep in mind folks this is like the 90s so this was not yeah. like let's send you a link to a screener or something these were academy voters that came um to watch presumably like in person in some sort of a screening room and i guess the documentarian folks they all they had a system the nomination committee sorry had a system where they each had a flashlight and when they gave up on a film, they would just like shine their flashlight at the screen, I guess. And then other people oh. would be like, either they would join in or not. Guess how many, guess how many minutes into Hoop Dreams, the documentary, the uh, nominating committee lasted in oh. Hoop Dreams. Again, just for context, it's a, what is it? It's, it's 171 minutes long. Guess how many minutes it took them to be like, we're done. 35 or? It was 20, supposedly. Wow. Wow. Like, I was like, you, What? So apparently, like, there was so much of a controversy about it. They had the Academy's executive director. They even released the voting results from whatever the water price, price yeah, waterhouse, yeah, price, whatever. Price water Cooper or something. Yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they wanted to see what, what voters, because it's like a rank system of zero to 10. And a small group of members, I mean, I got the quote here, a small group of members gave zeros to every single film except the five they wanted to see nominated, which you're like, what the? 
come yeah. on, that's not how this is supposed to work at all. You're like, what a, what a bunch of, what a dick move. And they gave tens to those five. So it completely skewed the voting, which you're like, also have a better fucking process for voting. Come on. Yeah. If you're going to be children about it. Then you're going to have to, you know, weight it properly or whatever. I have heard there are certain, there are certain branches of the academy that are notorious for being different, uh, like the <laughs> international branch yeah, and the documentary branch. And then um, the director's branch can sometimes go against like, say if like DGA nominated five people, the director's guild usually, or the director's branch will usually always find, you know, a foreign person to get nominated or something. Okay. You know, yeah. Throw it off a little bit, but, but that, yeah, that's very disheartening to hear. But, but obviously that movie I think will thrive in the, in the pantheon of. Oh great- yeah documentaries and you know the fact that criterion has it and it did pretty well i would say for a documentary box office wise as well so it's like you know that had you know at least gives it some vindication and i'm sure at some point it will be it'll probably get in like the national registry or something like that but uh but yeah that man that's just mm. yeah i checked that too it is it went in in 2005 okay good good officially (laughs) Preserved as culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. And yeah, I looked up, it had uh, almost 12 million, I think, worldwide box office. So like, that is not too shabby for a 170 minute documentary. But also like, it it didn't take me too long, but I also, my first watch was with my dad, who's a huge basketball fan. Like he was in from the get go. Yeah. Like, and so I was kind of feeling off his vibes and I didn't really, I wasn't that into basketball, but like you get wrapped up in, in William and Arthur's story, I think pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and it, it propels you and you see the growth. I think it's edited at a clip. They had 250 some hours to go through and put it into 171 minutes. And like, I, I mean, it's a long movie, but like, I, once you settle into it, like, I don't think you feel the running time. It's really well paced. Um, it's yeah. pretty engaging the whole way through you, you there's natural drama to the individual games, let alone their ambitions, let alone like how their play struck. Yeah. There's it's, it, it's great. <laughs> yeah. No, great. it's so good. But I was so livid when I, I was like that. No, that one. <laughs> oh my god i gotta i gotta study my academy awards a little better because i have a whole fictional narrative in my head of movies that ethan hawk has won hoop dreams right. has won right whoops <laughs> well it took 26 episodes but we finally synced it up and yeah. uh, so our official watch cha- challenge picks for oscar snub is hoop dreams aaron uh what challenge do you have in front of us for next time well it was my pick up for next time so one we're in february so we have black history month going on and one of my all-time favorite american filmmakers is spike lee and we haven't tackled spike lee yet so we are going to be doing spike lee films on our next challenge i do promise i've watched a bunch of spike lee movies but it's also he's one of those directors that i don't want to be done with his oeuvre yeah so there are some like culturally critically acknowledged masterpieces of his that i have not seen so i'm going to do something that i haven't seen um as my watch challenge there I won't be, I won't embarrass myself with, with some of those titles just yet, but I will mention them <laughs> on the next show. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited to, to kind of dive into some of the ones that I haven't seen either. Uh, if you want to send us your picks for Spike Lee films or suggest a topic or genre you'd like covered on a future show, please email us watch challenge podcast at gmail.com or in the links in the show. notes. And until next time, folks rate, review the show in whatever podcast app you are using at this moment. And uh, we'll see you with the next challenge. Mm-hmm.